shopping last week. I won't tell you where, lest I spoil any surprises. And I heard these words, Christ the babe is Lord of all, and Jesus, Lord at thy birth. I was not in a church, I was not reading my Bible, and yet these words rang out in public. What is it that the world stops and thinks about for just a moment? This is a remarkable thing that we would pause in our calendars and think about the birth of a baby some 2,000 years ago. It's appropriate that we should. It's appropriate that all of humanity would do so. I want to turn our attention to Isaiah chapter 9 this evening. And if you don't have a Bible, particularly if you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you one as a gift. There will be some men handing out Bibles, sort of making their way down the aisle. Just slip your hand up and, and let these men know that you need one. We would love for you to be able to follow along our meditation this evening with your own eyes in God's Word. Christ the babe is Lord of all. This word Christ is the word for Messiah. That is the anointed one, the expected one, the hoped for one. And we find out about this Messiah some 700 years before he was born in the words of Isaiah the prophet. And I would turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 9. And there the prophet records... These prophetic words, again, 700 years before Jesus was born. There will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. As with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff of their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior and the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of armies will accomplish this. A remarkable promise about world peace, the end of conflict, about prosperity, the bringing about of plenty for all on the earth and the joy of harvest for the end of all hostility. For a government, a global politic that will be free of corruption and will only exhibit justice and righteousness. All of this is promised through this promised one, the Messiah. It is no mistake that he is called a wonderful counselor. No mistake that he is called mighty God. No mistake that he is called Eternal Father. No mistake that he is called Prince of Peace, Prince of Shalom. This one, this baby born at Bethlehem is none other than God in the flesh. And as God, he is Father over all, and he is the only one who can solve all of the world's conflicts and troubles. Jesus the Christ came as a baby to solve mankind's deepest problem. And that is not a problem outside. It is not a problem with global politics fundamentally. It is a problem of sin in the heart of every human being. All of us have made messes of our lives. We do by nature uh, what is intrinsic to us. We are born rebels against God, though created by God, sustained by God at every moment. 
And we all were in desperate need of a solution we could not provide here on earth. Somebody not from around here had to come and rescue all of us trapped in a slavery to sin and to darkness. I want to turn your attention to a song. It is Psalm 110 in the Old Testament. This one, written a thousand years before Christ came, tells us what Christ is doing even now. You see, we live between times. Not everything that Isaiah chapter 9 promised has come to pass. Oh, a child has been born, a son has been given, but there is not an end to conflict. There are corrupt governments in place all over the world. There are people in need. There is not global plenty. There is much yet to be done. The babe has come. He grew to be a man. He went to a cross and died in the place of sinners to pay for the sins of everyone who would believe. And his work is not yet done. Psalm 110 tells us what happens in the between times. Here, David, the songwriter, says, Yahweh says to my Lord, that is, God the Father speaks to Jesus the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will be free will offerings in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. What is Jesus doing now? He came as a baby. He went to a cross. He rose from the grave. And now he waits. According to Psalm 110, the first three verses, he waits for his rightful place to sit as king over the earth. This implies that he is returning. He is coming again. He did not finish all of Messiah's work in the first time he came. Who is this one? This is Jesus the Messiah, the God-man. Charles Spurgeon wrote, During the present interval, through which we wait for his glorious appearing and his visible millennial kingdom, Jesus is in the place of power and his dominion is in no jeopardy. Otherwise, he would not remain quiet. Jesus waits for the right time to return to the earth that he owns to rule as is his right. Friends, make no mistake, Jesus waiting is not licensed for us to live however we would in ignorance of him, forgetting that he came the first time as a baby, forgetting that he went to a cross and died to pay for sins for all who would turn to him. We must remember that he waits to come back to rule and to reign. All of us will meet him. There's a second aspect to Christ here in this psalm. It's found in verse 4. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is a picture of what Jesus has finished at the cross. Not all of his Messiah work is done. But his work to pay for sins is finished once and for all. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Three serious oath statements from God himself. God speaks, he swears, he is not changing his mind. What about the king that he promised is also a priest such a thing was illegal under Mosaic law. The king could not be a priest. The priest could not be of the kingly line. Someone else of another line had to come. All those priests in the Old Testament, they all died. But this one coming who would be a priest and king would die and rise from the dead. He is simultaneously the king of peace, the king of shalom, and he is the king of righteousness. He is the only one that could bring peace between sinners and a holy God and bring peace on earth. Our king took a painful crown of thorns. 
He took a mocking scepter made of reeds and a purple robe as a costume for the amusement of his tormentors. He was lifted up before the world, not with the honor that was due him, but stripped naked, bloodied, shamed, and scorned, so that by his death he could offer to God a sacrifice of atonement for sin. The king was a victim. The priest was the sacrifice. The author of life subjected himself to death. The innocent and beautiful son of the father clothed himself in the sins of humanity so that he could endure the punishment due those sins. And that king, the author of life, could not be held down by death. He rose again. He sits at the right hand of the Father and waits for the right time for what this psalm discloses as the end. Verse 5, the Lord, that is Jesus, is at Yahweh's right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses and shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. All of these phrases at the end of this song depict the victorious triumph of the King of Kings. In his first coming, Jesus said, I thirst as he hung on a cross. In his second coming, he will drink with ease by the brook because he owns everything. He was the one who shed his blood And he will be the one who spills the blood of his enemies at his return. Friends, do you know this Christ? His name is on the lips of singers in our malls. Do you know him from the heart? Not as the emblem of some holiday on the calendar. But as God who took on flesh and came to earth to pay for your sins. Your sins can only be paid for if you believe in him by faith. Trusting that his death on the cross could actually pay for your sins and take them away for all time. If you are rightly related to him by faith then you are prepared for his return. But friend, if you have not submitted yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ now, when he comes a second time as conquering king, you will be utterly unprepared for what follows. Our Christmas encouragement to you, all who would listen, is to have soft hearts now towards the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who offers to you life and forgiveness and eternity. What a gift that God himself would come and pay for sins. It's our joy to sing to him and worship him. I will close in prayer. We'll sing a couple more songs, and I hope you can remain for a few moments and enjoy hot cocoa with us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you look down on our miserable plight. We in our rebellion against you, in our darkness, in our sin. Perhaps with a fist in the air against your ways. Perhaps ignorantly going about our business. Lord, we thank you that you have drawn our attention in these moments to what most matters that we are your creatures dependent at every moment for our very existence. And our crimes stand between us and you as that which makes an infinite separation. But you have bridged that infinite gap by sending your beloved son to die in the place of all who would believe that we might have access to you again. Oh God, would we be worshipers like those ancient pagan kings who traversed great distance to come and bow before you. May we bow before you this evening and worship you as you deserve, surrendering our lives to you. God, would you be honored even as we celebrate this time. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.